You guys are great. You come, this class comes to order a lot faster than some of my freshman classes. You guys get an A for the day. Um, well, thank you again for coming. Um, my name is Jeff Gruber. I spoke last week about the history of the Zonalite Corporation and the discovery of vermiculite. And this week we'll continue that discussion and we're going to segue into um, the time period when W.R. Grace bought the local corporation in 1963. And this will not take me very long today. Um, we feel the, the, the interesting part of today's talk is going to be our panel of three former workers at the, at the local operation that we will bring up here and we have prepared questions that uh, we will ask them and you guys are in for a treat um, just because of their insight you can, you can hear talks on the history of things anytime you want that's what television is for but um, to actually hear watch these people and talk about their experiences and their their impressions about their time as employees of WR Grace it will be very interesting I'll start today's, can you guys hear me okay? I feel like I'm not talking very well. I'm going to start today's lecture. I don't know how many people are switching back and forth, but last year's afternoon session did not see this photograph. I forgot to put it in, and that's the benefit of giving the same lecture twice. In school, my second period students always get a more thorough lecture than my first period students. Uh, but this is a, a photograph of mine. This is from Ray Kajala's. Um, master's thesis in 1944 um, showing the the mine and of course you can see the the marks from the excavator the loader loading the ore onto the trucks but you can see the the various types of ore in this ore body it was not solid vermiculite it was not solid anything it was all kinds of stuff of which Dr. Meeker alluded to two weeks ago now the dark stuff is the, the high-grade vermiculite the grayer materials is waste products. I, I forget now, cyanide, biotite, something. And then you can also see the, the veins. And I won't say exactly what they are, but Ray Kajawa did have a notation that this vein right here was tremolite. That was the only one labeled of those veins, but maybe these others looking like that might have been as, as well. But so just you can kind of visualize what the what the impurities look like. That was that was the bad stuff. And of course there was other smaller ones throughout the ore body. This is what the mine looked like in 1969. This would have been six years after Grace bought the operation. This would have been right before the the process began to update the milling uh, machinery. Significant investment on the hill. Um, this is very profound, the, the ore or the waste from the mine. This is a direct waste, a waste rock. And of course, after the process, a conveyor or later pipeline then brought the waste on this side. The road going down, of course, you can see the emissions from the dry mill there. And uh, again, that's uh, both steam and, of course, some dust in that as well. But that's what the mill looked like. And, six years after Grace bought the operation. So the, the merger took place in 1963. It didn't make big news in Libby. I don't know if they expected that, um, that um, you know, it would change things a lot, but the Western News just has a, a few small um, stories on it. And I should mention that the previous year, 1962, something interesting happened. And for the life of me, I don't know if this was important or not, but 1962, the headline said, Zonalite stockholders to vote on merger. And again, this is 1962, so I was thinking to myself when I saw the headline, well, what's this going on here? They didn't merge till 63. And so it said that stockholders of Zonalite's company will meet at the principal office in Libby July 24th to elect directors for the ensuing year and to consider a merger between the Zonalite Company of Montana Corporation and the Zonalite Company of Delaware. The proposed merger 
according to the directors and management, will provide flexibility of operations essential to future growth. Change of domicile from Montana to Delaware will permit stockholders, stockholder meetings to be held in the east, where the majority of the stockholders live. Under Montana law, the annual meeting must be held in Montana. Uh, this failed. Again, it just a week later they said it didn't happen. And then the next year, Grace buys them. So I don't know, just a question comes to mind I'll probably never answer, but uh, they, they talked about changing from a Montana corporation to a Del uh, Delaware corporation. Uh, we'll move on to 1972. Uh, one thing I did find in the Western News looking for information for this talk, there wasn't a lot of stories about what was going on, going on up there in the hill. You guys that worked up there were kind of on your own up there. Uh, gosh, the, the lumber mill down here, every week there was somebody retiring and knew this, knew that, and you guys were quiet up there. But this is a small article, 1972, the state of Montana did issue a variance, you know, for the air quality permit. And I'll read to you just a small article. The State Board of Health Friday granted another year's variance from state air pollution control standards to the Zonalite operations on Vermiculite Mountain, northeast of here. The extension of the variance for the Construction Products Division of W.R. Grayson Company was granted by the board in recognition of the ongoing program to control pollution which is part of the modernization and expansion project now underway. And uh, 1972 was in the middle of that. Starting in 1970, they started designing, and construction started after this, but they started designing a significant investment in new mills and machinery to rec in recognition of the dust problem up there. Um, and again, I don't want to talk too much because the, the fellows that are going to be up here after a while will be able to talk about it because <coughs> I really am out of my league here. But it um, started in 70 through about 74 when construction was about finished in 1974. Um, it was a big investment. And why did they? It's because of maybe a sign like this. Uh, I found this myself. Uh, I worked at, at uh, in summers, as teachers do sometimes, at one of the old Grace buildings down by the, the Little League ball fields. And uh, sitting on a shelf was a, a, pat, a pile of these things. So I just grabbed one and took it home, just thought it was kind of cool. But uh, somebody that, that worked up there told me that when he started working there in 1969 at that export plant, every boxcar load of stuff they shipped out had this staple to the door. That was in 1969. So anyhow, it says it may conform or contain up to 1% asbestiform tremolite. Overexposure may cause risk of cancer or respiratory disease. It says avoid creating dust. Use with adequate ventilation. W.R. Grace and Company, Libby, Montana, here's the date. Uh, and it says this was treated with a dust suppressant, and those guys tell me it was uh, soybean oil, I believe. I think when you expanded it at the plants, it smelled like popcorn, I think. I'm just kidding on that. <laughs> so a little talk now, and again, these, these guys that will talk to you later will, will tell you more about this. Um, they spent $17 million in that operation. This is the new OSB building, as it was called. Um, this basically this had one function and that was to take all the various grades of ore from the mine and blend them into a consistent uh, feed into the mill because uh, the milling process is like consistency. It doesn't matter if you're milling copper, gold, whatever, vermiculite. You like a consistent feed in the mill. And so this is quite an operation. You can see the man standing right there. This building was huge. I was in it twice when I my two times in my school career, we took tours up there. And uh, they told us it was almost big enough to play a football game in. And uh, having been a long time ago, I can't remember so much, but I just remember it was a huge building. It was cool in there in the summer. I've heard workers say that sometimes the deer wanted in there to avoid the heat. But the OS and B building. And then this is the new wet mill up on the hill. 
This is probably around 1975. Um, those of you that know your vehicles could maybe date it closer than that. But this is the OSB building right here. And then the uniform feed grade would come into here. This building was, I don't know, 11 or 12 stories high, three stories underground, because the, the ground is sloping on the other side. You can see the bottom on the other side there, but there's three floors still underneath the ground here. And this is where they uh, take the ore and remove the impurities, uh, leaving uh, vermiculite concentrate, as they called it, all, in all various sizes. Uh, they, they, they didn't size it until down by the river in the screening plant. Uh, Bob or one of you guys, what's this? Is this the powerhouse or dryers or what is that? This is the plume right there. Did you guys know? So it's the dryer. Okay, so that's the, the dryers there. Um, and I'll read you a little bit more about the operations here in a bit. And then this is down at the river, and this is the only photograph I could get of the screening plant. Highway 37 is right here. And of course the conveyor that I showed you last week that Zonalite built across the river. So at the screening plant here, this was a third part of their modernization. And this is where the vermiculite concentrate was trucked down in trucks, would go through this process. This thing was 11 stories tall. Just imagine driving up the river today and seeing this large green building you know, well over 100 feet tall. It was a pretty imposing structure. So it was right there, and that's where the, they, 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 they graded the vermiculite into five different sizes they marketed. So that's called the screening plant. And the other part, their modernization, was this dam. Now, they had a dam before, but I believe it was, it was heightened. It was made larger. And I, think, I believe they rerouted Rainy Creek around it, I think. And so that was another part to help uh, decrease the water pollution in Rainy Creek. So, you know, $17 million, and the question that came to mind here a while ago, and I looked up on the internet, $17,000 in 1974, what's it worth in today's dollars? In today's dollars, um, allowing for appreciation by the consumer price index, $17 million then is equal to $74,304,000 today. So uh, you need to think about as a Libby citizen, you know, a uh, worker, you know, when a uh, corporate entity in your town is investing $74 million. Imagine how that would make us feel today. You know, that was a huge investment at the time. Did the new investments of $17 million do what they were designed for? Or was the Libby vermiculite fairly flawed to where even modern science can't make it safe? You know, and, and I, you can't see much written about that. And these guys might talk about that some. Even the books that have come out, The Air That Kills or whatever, they talk very little about this modernization program. You know, and I just, why, why don't they? What, you know, why don't they talk about it more? Because compared to that old dry mill, Grace invested all this money into trying to make a, a cleaner product. And of course, you know, because they closed in 1990, they didn't quite make it. So, you know, they, they really did invest a lot of, of, of ingenuity and, and, and financial resources to do so. This was a Libya export plant. I didn't show this last week. I, it was an oversight. But this was built during World War II to um, these silos here, probably for the four different sizes of stuff they shipped out at that time. Over here... Behind here was the expanding plant. And I told you they didn't, they kind of fell on their face for expanding the stuff. I think probably their expansion plant here was probably just for local uses. Maybe they shipped Bonners Ferry, Kalispell, places like that. But they did have an expanding plant there. The big commercial one was down by the Neal's Mill. Um, and that operated in just a short time. This is where that, you know, our, our, our Photograph we show with all of our advertisements. That baseball field is right here. Just a flyer. Uh, once Grace took over, you hear some of the same language when you talk about a wonder material. It says, once they say the people are on Libby, in northwestern corner of Montana, it's called vermiculite, rotten mica. Vermiculite had no dignity, no purpose in those days. 
They required true vision to see vermiculite's hidden values in the 1920s. Forty years later, the mineral has become a vital part of American industry and agriculture. Now it's often called the wonder mineral. It's a home insulation and soil conditioner. Fertilizer companies use it to, pre use it to prevent caking. It fireproofs many of the country's important buildings. Vermiculite deadens sound in classrooms and in motels. I should get some of that. Vermiculite is a hydrated magnesium, aluminum, iron, silicate, similar to mica, but capable of expanding when heated. Mined ore from Libya is shipped by Zonalite Division WR Grayson Company to more than 50 processing plants in the U.S., Canada, and overseas. Montana can be proud of its vermiculite industry, as Zonalite is proud to be part of Montana, past and future. This flyer, uh, I found, came across this. This is uh, printed in February 1989, just a year before the place shut down. So I thought it might give us a good snapshot into what was going on at Grace in 1989. I'll just read you a few things. It says that uh, during the mining and milling processes, there is a certain amount of dust generated. All access roads and pit roads are given regular treatments of dust suppressants. All mine vehicles are equipped with cab filters and pressurizers so that the air is probably much cleaner than in the average car, equipped with air conditioning in similar circumstances. It says that dust generating points are enclosed with ventilating hoods. All ventilating systems are equipped with filters and bag houses that remove airborne particles. As a result, dust levels in all areas, either inside buildings or outside, are well below state and federal levels. Some concentrates are hauled to Libby and bagged for export or, so, or special order. Um, and it said still in 1989, the largest size particle is used as a loose fill insulation for homes, industrial buildings. So things were still continuing much as usual, I guess, according to that, but uh, dust seems to be getting a lot of mention, the fight against dust. And I'll end with this. This is an oral history interview of Earl Lovick, uh, done in 1980. And so we have some words of his concerning what was going on up there in 1980. And again, so I started talking about dust, and uh, he talks about it some in here. Um, he starts out with, research was done in the late 60s. Remember, they bought it in 63. Research done in the late 60s concentrated research on the development of a new process. They needed to change for a number of reasons, including getting our water discharge under control again because of environmental problems, and upgrading the technology which we had developed for concentrating vermiculite in a more efficient manner than we had previously actually known. This is a conservation of a resource too by utilizing more of the material. The present mill was begun in 1970, and 1974 was fully operational. This is entirely a wet process. We solved our air quality problem. We solved our water quality problem, since we have a closed water circuit. None of the water is used in the processing is discharged into Rainy Creek or into the Kootenai River, so there's no contamination of the water supply. The dust in the processing is all collected in bag houses, so there's very little dust discharged into the atmosphere. It is a very environmentally efficient operation. Now, continuing on, uh, talking about the roads in the mine. Today we put a considerable amount of effort into putting dust retardants in the road. In those days, we used to try to suppress the dust with water, which is quite inefficient and not very long-lasting, particularly in the summer months when the dust is the worst. Today we used different dust retardants that are much more efficient and much more effective. Uh, when asked, is there asbestos in the vermiculite, he replies, there is asbestos in the vermiculite deposit. This is very closely monitored by ourselves and by MSHA, which is the Mining Safety and Health Administration. They have quite strict standards. All of our areas are well within the standards, which are allowable concentrations set up by federal government. We have been able to, with this new mill, control the dust to well below the standards. When we had the dry mill, conditions were worse, and respirators were required. There was considerable more dust in the atmosphere. But again, this is an entirely wet process today, and it is easier to control. Uh, 
We're talking about research. He says, we have a research department in Libya whose primary function is to improve the technology of what we are doing metallurgically with vermiculite. Trying to improve the recoveries, make a pure product. I say pure product, I mean a higher grade concentrate. And then finally, um, in addressing the problems that were tried to be solved in the 1974 modernization, the interviewer asks, was the EPA the main emphasis to decide these problems? Earl Lubbock says, well, the EPA and, of course, the state environmental people, which are a division of the Montana State Board of Health, they have an air quality bureau and a water quality bureau, and we deal with both these bureaus. They have been very cooperative. The narrator says, has it been fairly easy to maintain and keep up with these standards? And Earl replies, yes, we have managed to keep up with established standards. We have a full-time environmental engineer on staff, and he has technicians working for him. We monitor all these things very closely. So yes, you know, Mr. Lovick gets the word because this is all we have, the, the words left in 1980. Um, you know, uh, the other three miners that will be coming up here in a minute or so will be able to, you know, flesh these out, you know, these, these words out more. I want to end with this. You're looking at an emblem. This was Libby's official emblem in 1920. Libby's emblem, the hub of undeveloped resources. You young people out there, the, the wheel hub, you don't see those much anymore, but uh, um, wagon wheels, you always had the hub that kept it on the, the wagon, right in the middle, the hub. But the various things, pleasure resorts, mineral, timber, agriculture, horticulture, stock raising, dairy, water power. Natural resources were, were big into Libby's beginning. They founded Libby. And we have to remember that natural resources shaped our culture. Today, Libby's culture is much different and is still evolving. So I just want to just caution all of us in the room. Don't be quick to judge and rationalize about events on the hill. The vermiculite mine was a state-of-the-art enterprise utilizing skilled personnel, again, of what you're going to hear a few, of a few in a minute or so, Skilled personnel producing a miracle material that literally had a thousand uses. Um, W.R. Grace announced the closure of the Libby Mill in 1990, and they seized operations on September 28th of the same year, 1990. They had quite an amount of concentrate uh, built up, and they shipped that in the coming months. And in December of the same year, 1990, they started dismantling the operations on the hill. So 1990 brings us to the end of, of the operations. Session, so hopefully we'll get to some more of those tonight as well. But without any further ado, I'd like to introduce, for those of you who don't know some of these folks, um, or at least a little bit more about them, <coughs> they're probably all familiar faces. On my far left is Bob Beagle, who was um, born up the river in Moreland. And uh, so you from up the creek, right, Ron? And then uh, you, did your dad work on the railroad? Is that what yes. your father was a railroad person? Yeah. But you graduated um, from Libby High School, is that right? And, uh, and worked at the mill for uh, several, a few years before he decided to go to work at the mine in 1969. And then I uh, worked many jobs, primarily in construction, Bob did. Um, and, or as they called most of the work, operating engineers. I guess you were all operating engineers. Um, he also served as a union representative up there. And then next to him is Leroy Tom. These guys are all born in Montana, by the way, born and raised in Montana. Leroy uh, grew up around Roundup. He was a farm kid, right? A rancher kid. And uh, he moved to Libby in 1967 and then went to work up at the mine uh, in 1974. Um, first, he worked for a short period of time in the old dry mill that Jeff was talking about and then uh, went and bid the job in 74 for the new wet mill as well and started work there then. Worked for Grace for 17 years and he also worked on the teardown um, that started in 1990. 
which Jack, your date was September 28th, 1990, and that's only, what's well, tomorrow? <laughs> 12, 22 years later. So think about that. Um, after you, after the teardowns, then uh, Leroy opened a business in around 2002 with uh, Montana Machine and Fabrication. And many of you have probably had him build things for you, or at least know of things he's built. And he's been involved also in many uh, community groups uh, surrounding the community and health issues um, uh, since, since 2002 as well. So they've always been involved in those. And then, what's that? 92. Since 92. I misread your note to me. Rocks were soft. Okay. <laughs> and then Bob Marazzo was on my immediate left. Uh, was born in Kalispell and was fortunate enough to be able to work in his field of accounting when he graduated from Carroll College and uh, came here to work with uh, CNL Plumbing um, many years ago. When during the down years, sort of, they I guess about um, yeah, but he went to work for the mine in 1977 and um, as an administrative manager there. So we have a cross section. And so I'd like you to welcome these folks, and uh, we'll look forward to to uh, hearing what you have to say this time around. And I'm sure it'll be different. Thanks for being with us. One of the first questions we'd like to ask you guys, if we could, is what was going on around the world, or here at least, um, in this area? What was going on in Libya or in the state when you hired on with this outfit? And what influenced you to choose to work there? There were a lot of jobs around in the late 60s, early 70s, so there were more choices, perhaps. And what made you choose to work up at the mill? So what was going on? What made your choices there? You go first. Senior member. <laughs> when I went to work in 69, it was just prior to the influx of the dam workers. But I had worked at the mill for seven years and had a disagreement down there, so I was looking for work. And uh, I got hired on a drone light. And uh, I was there until they shut down in 90. Who hired you? Bill Dorrington. You know, Bill Dorrington was one of the oldest guys around there, I think. I graduated in 73, left Libby for the summer and went and ended up logging and then come back in the spring of 74 with the idea that I wanted to go, I wanted to go to work at the mine. Um, I had an opportunity to go to work at the sawmill and uh, I didn't, I didn't see a future in the sawmill. Um, and so I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to work in the mine, it's steady work, and I was just getting married, and so I wanted something that was going to be there for the long term. And so I went to work at the Zolite Company, WR for WR Grace, and that was in like April of 1974. And I worked there until the, until the shutdown, and then worked on the teardown. Uh, and 1990, 92, and then I left there and then started started my own business, Montana Machine. Leroy, did, you know, when you applied to work up there, you you saw it as a stable place. Did you know people that worked up there? Did you follow people? Did you? I mean, I'm just one thing I wondered about: did, did sons follow fathers that worked up there? Did you ever see a tradition like that? Um. I don't know to what degree there was like the sons. I mean, I, I know that there was some, you know, sons that followed fathers. Uh, not, not in my case. Um, I went to, went to work up there because I thought it was a, you know, a stable environment. It didn't pay as much money as the mill downtown did at the at the time, but it seemed like it just was a it was just a better place to work where I wanted to invest my time in. And so that's that was my decision to, or the reason for my decision. And I, and I went down there, you know, and and it was Bill Dorrington was doing the hiring at the time, and I going down there, and no, no work today, and I 
I'd go down the next day, no work, you know. And I just I kept going down there. And uh, one of the, uh, I had a friend that worked for the employment service at the time. And uh, he knew I was look, trying to get a job down there. And so he went over and he told Dorrington, he says, you better hire that young guy. <laughs> you know, he's gonna, you, you know, he's gonna be running that place someday if you don't want to hire him, you know. And uh, so they, I went down there and a couple days later they hired me and I went to work up there in the, in the labor pool. So that's how I started. I graduated uh, high school in Kalispell, Montana, Flathead High School in 1967 and uh, came to work up here in the summer of 68 for CNL Plumbing. Uh, one related to the dam, so that was the, the big thing going on in this part of the country at that time. And uh, I worked for them during the summers all the way through the time that I went to school, and then they offered me a job uh, in my as in, working in the office as an office manager, and that made use of my degree, which was in accounting. And so I worked for them until 1977, and I went to work for Zolite when the uh, fellow by the name of John Liebichek, who was the accountant. Uh, was transferring to some some other uh, job, and this was an accounting job in this part of the country, and um, so I could stay here. And my family was here. And my wife, I, I met my wife in Libby, and etc. So I felt fortunate to be able to go to work for them in a field, and, and still work in the field that I, you know, studied in, and. Uh, would probably still be there today if uh, if they were still open. Thanks, Bob. Uh, so one of the questions that some of the students have had is is um, when you went to work there, how were you were you prepared, and how were you prepared for the uh, the dust and all the other there's other safety hazards as well associated with mining. Um, so how were you prepared for working with that? Um, the time. Well, um, when I went to work up there, like I said, it was 1974, and that was the that was kind of the era of the what we classified as kind of the end of the dust area, and they started a new process of uh, a flotation process for for uh, for separation of their of their ore from their gang material. Or, and so, uh, to me, um, uh, even though I did work there for several months when the old system was still going and I got to see how dusty it really was, um, I was not, um, I had no red flags about the dust or nothing because in, like I said, in the fall of 1974, they started up the new mill and I was part of that new era of, of that type of, of mining. And so I, I, I didn't have the concern. I'd heard about it prior to that, you know, that the old miners and stuff had had issues and stuff with lung disease and stuff. But um, I wasn't, um, feel, I didn't feel uh, that I was entering into a job that was any more risky than any other job that you do. Um, there's in the mining you have a certain amount of risk that you that you are going to entertain, and uh, quite honestly, um, uh, all the years that I worked up there, I worked 17 years up there, never had an incident or an accident. I started my own business, and within six months, I lost a finger. So go fish. <laughs> Leroy, you, you said you, you logged for a while, right? Um, I did. you want to just comment a little bit about the perception in 1973, uh, risk in the woods perhaps, was that considered a dangerous occupation as well? Um, absolutely, and I, and I worked as a, I was a sawyer and I also ran, ran a skitter, uh, both of them, and, uh, you know, that was 
relatively fresh out of high school and I was actually working on uh, down in the St. Joe River down that way and uh, we were sawing um, old growth uh, larch and old growth white pine that was you know three feet at the butt and there was it was huge tall timber and actually one of the guys that was sawing above me actually saw the tree and it come down below and hit me and it was fortunately it was in the winter time and it was very steep and when and it was a white pine and when the tree that actually hit me it was about eight inches in diameter where it hit me but it was in such a steep and enough snow that it just kind of shot me down the hill and dented my hard hat but I was okay other than that. Not, Not my head, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, there's a <laughs> there was there's a lot of dangers in the in logging and, uh, and like I said, I was I had a my fill of that in a short period of time. Bob, how about you for the dust and awareness of the dust? That's sort of thing. Um, well, I was, when I was uh, interviewed, um, I, I wasn't aware of the size of the Grace operation or the, 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 uh, the, uh, uh, the amount of you know, work and effort and the number of people that worked there. Grace, for some reason, Zone Light Grace came kind of a low profile, but when I was interviewed, I was uh, asked uh, by Earl and, and by Bob Oliverio, um, what I you know knew about industrial disease, or, or or was I aware of the term asbestosis, and and uh, that there was asbestos with this, and there was a certain amount of hazard, but uh, you were required in certain areas to, to wear your respirators or your mask and dust mask or, and hard hats and all those things. And like Leroy said. You know that when you go to work for a, you know, a company or any, I guess, natural resource, there's certain hazards. So I didn't uh, think anything uh, about the the dust situation or the the hell situation. Uh, the one thing I, I was asked at the time was, uh, uh, "Do I know uh, the term mesothelioma?" And I didn't. Uh, I was aware of silicosis and black lung and other industrial disease my, from my family's from Butte and my grandfather died of silicosis complications. So that was fine. And, uh, but I went home after the interview and I was rummaging around trying to find what this mesothelioma thing was about. And, I didn't say this before, but my wife had to look it up for me. <laughs> she, she was a little bit more of a sense she was a teacher uh, at it than I was. So. But uh, that didn't bother me uh, so much. I, uh, during the time that I worked at Grace, I thought they continued to try and make a cleaner product. And uh, I thought that they had a, a safe record. Uh, Unlike this mine, even uh, or other mines, I'll just, I didn't make this comment this afternoon. But uh, from the time that this this mine had operated in the 1920s, all the way through Universal Insulation, all the way through Zone Light, all the way through the WR Brace uh, period, there were only two deaths on uh, and and some almost uh, 2,000 employees during those years. And the two deaths occurred in the 50s prior to, to Grace being around. So, I believe it was a safe place. Okay, great. Thank you. So, along those lines, did you have friends that, um, that you knew and you knew that um, decided not to work up there because of their health concerns or um, friends that got sick while you were there um, as, uh, in terms of, of dust or other other mining hazards? Well, I, I don't, don't know if anybody actually just quit because of the dust. I, there was someone that got sick and had to stop working. And uh, some of that was uh, due to the dust or lung problems. Well, yeah, this is, uh, same here. I, 
I know of nobody that ever uh, left the left MDR Grace for uh, because they were concerned about their health. Um, and and you know I do I do remember some of the older uh, folks that were there that had lung disabilities that didn't, you know that were still up there and, and uh, but in a, you know ended up retiring or or you know quitting or because of the disability but not I guess I should say not for quitting but they retired from from there with disabilities related to lung disease. Then the students had one more question along those lines, and there's that popular smoking policy that came in around 1977 or 78, somewhere in there. And that's about the time other businesses were starting to not allow smoking on the premises as well, uh, as I recall in some of the places I worked. But anyway, um, how did that work up there? Tell us what, what happened with that. Oh, well, we can probably have several stories about that. <laughs> um, and it, I, I was fortunate I never was a smoker, uh, but uh, they enacted a smoking ban in the, in the late 70s and uh, the union, and I, and I was part of that, I was, I was on the board of the union at that time, and we took it to arbitration because we felt that Grace had not um, in any way uh, presented an argument good enough to for a reason for to force people to quit smoking uh, because of, we were with, within compliance of MSHA and this and the state of Montana as far as our uh, levels of dust in our product or and, and in the air and it was controlled or the court wasn't by you had to wear respirators or or they were closed off and, and air air uh, airbags and stuff like that were used, uh, dust collection systems and stuff like that. So um, anyway, the union took an arbitration. Ultimately, we lost that arbitration. And we still didn't understand because the arbitrator was very vague in how he determined uh, the smoking. And, and you know, Deborah Grace, took, uh, they, uh, they uh, imposed the smoking ban they offered smoking classes for people to quit smoking and stuff like that. But quite honestly, um, I would say that the majority of people that smoked continued to smoke, and that was both on whether it was a union personnel or whether it was company personnel. They, just, they all still, a lot of them, I should say, I don't, I'm not going to say they all did, but a lot of them still continue to smoke until we shut down. Any other thoughts along those lines? Or? How I say that I'm going to sue W.R. Grace for this. I wasn't a smoker, but I always got to go in the pickup of the guys that smoked, and that's how I got that secondhand smoke. <laughs> uh, and, and, and I was there when the smoking ban when was, was stopped. First of all, uh, I, I ended up Hire and doing the hiring as part of my job after a, a few years of work there. So, and at that time, we, we started to screen in the applications, ask if they were a smoker, and made a point of not hiring the smokers. And then after that, the smoking ban itself came in. Uh, this is partly fueled because Johns Mansville had won a case uh, in which they banned smoking in one of their, uh, in their facilities. So, of uh, Grace then uh, enacted that it had to be. But uh, I also don't believe, like you said, uh, there was smoking on the property after that, both now loaded and salary. Uh, but I don't believe, I was going to ask Leroy before, I don't believe anybody was ever terminated for getting caught smoking. Were they? I don't think so. Not, not to my. No, I, I know no. They might saw the letter in them in their file or something, but it never went to. Any yeah, and I and I do. I recall a couple of times uh, people were reprimanded for. I mean, when you're smoking right in front of your supervisor, you know, <laughs> that's not really a good thing. But uh, I, I I know that there was some reprimands given for it. 
nobody ever lost their job because of that. Um, you know, with all the 12 years you guys worked up on the hill, if you could maybe just help us understand what, what were some of the best times working up there, and along with that, what were some of the challenging times? What, what do you remember of your cumulative years up there? What, what stands out as interesting or fun? Well, we could talk about a lot of that because there was, there was a certain amount of horseplay and as I'm sure there is in, in, in every job. Um, I, so probably some of the bad times was, uh, I'll start with that because that's probably easier uh, for me anyway. Um, some of the bad times were uh, when, uh, when Grace started losing some of their market, some of their market share and some of their sales and uh, we started having shutdowns and layoffs and Got, you've seen a lot of your friends and, our, and, and ourselves. You know, I was fortunate and Bob was fortunate that we were in, he was in the construction department, I was in the millwright department. And during these shutdowns, they'd shut down for two weeks at a time. And we would usually work most of those times, but most of the folks that worked up there were laid off. So it was a hardship for them. And I, towards the, in the later years, I've seen, we've seen a lot, of, a lot more of that that went on because of the reduction in production. And uh, so that, that was probably one of the hardships for me. And the fact that we went from over 200 people working up there to, uh, I don't remember what, uh, what we ended up with, uh, you know, some, somewhere around 100 or so. So you see a lot of your friends that ended up being laid off and not being able to work up there. So that would be some of the worst times. Some of the some of the good times we, I, I mean, like, like I said, we had some whole, we had horse play and stuff like that. We used to uh, used to be a big thing around Christmas. We'd always have, I mean, we'd have alcohol on the hill, and uh, and you know, and it was it was always kept you know fairly fairly well. And then one year it got to the point where the guys started drinking on the bus on the way up the hill. <laughs> You know, and so by the time we got up there, like 8.30, 9 o'clock, well, I can remember one of the guys over by the skip shack at 9 o'clock, he was passed out, laying, leaning up against, on a stairway, leaning up against the wall, passed out, and our manager come walking through, and here's this guy already drunk, and he says, you know what, this is our last year, <laughs> and, it, and it was, <laughs> it was the last year, it was probably for the good, because we would, we would, be drinking and we'd be doing, of course, all the crazy things you do when you drink from everything. I remember that day. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were over by the stairwell. No. But uh, Don Riley and I started taking guys home at noon. And I didn't get home until about 7.30. And the wife was mad at Al. It was Christmas Eve and I wasn't home. And we were at, oh, that long getting on everybody home. Um, again, the good times uh, working on the hill for me it was, it was almost all, all of the time uh, at work. Uh, I was most accountants or pencil pushers for a company like that would work in an office and be stuck there all day. I had the opportunity of, uh, of if I had questions, I could just walk out and go to the mill and I could you know, or go to the garage or go to, to talk to the supervisor and, and actually see what was being done and actually be able to put the spending uh, correlated to the, the project that was going on. That was always very interesting to me. One of the more challenging ones was when the, uh, in 1979 the uh, railroad came by and wiped out our loading facility at, at, um, at the river and the bells across there, and uh, you know, we, I think that happened on a Sunday morning, I went to work right away, uh, and between the entire company, we, were, we made every shipment, we never lost one shipment or one lost day uh, of shipping, uh, and we were able to work together to, to get that done, so that was uh, always enjoyable. And, 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 
uh, a good reason to stay in and work. Just one other thing that I, I think it might have been a low for you as a, as being on salary, and that was uh, the union actually went out on strike over a I mean, in a contract negotiation, ultimately over for ten cents. And uh, but it was a time when everybody we worked a lot of hours. The crews were they were just kind of fed up with everything from the long hours. And we went into contract negotiations, and you know what? It wouldn't have mattered what we were offered. The the body was ready to just go out. They they were looking for a vacation, and they went out on. We I should say they we went out on strike, and uh, so then the uh, salary people then tried to run the operations themselves, and uh, they they actually did it. But they they would do one section because there wasn't enough people to run the whole operation, obviously. So they'd go run part here, and then they'd go down, and, and they were, you know, I can't, I can't even imagine what it would look like up there, but I've heard lots of stories. Maybe, Bob, you can expand on that. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the low part about that particular thing was uh, we, we put in a lot of hours, because I would do the, uh, the office work in the evening and get sent up to do something on the hill that... Uh, Bob Oliveri was very supportive of us. And, um, his favorite thing to do was bring around Gatorade for us to drink. You know, Gatorade just in hack it. <laughs> Bob, you didn't say too much about the best times or whatever. You were construction foreman. I just, I'm curious, what, what did you, what do you remember constructing or building up there that was challenging and in your building? <coughs> First, I was never a yellow hat, so I was not a farmer. <laughs> but we had a lot of interesting times. Uh, when the conveyor belt got knocked down, we built that conveyor belt was very interesting. But we always got in on all the, all the excitement. When somebody drive a car off the road or tip over a truck or something, we'd always get sent out there with the crane to straighten it out. And it was always a good time. We had something different every day. You alluded to yellow hat, green hat things. Tell us about that a little bit. Oh yeah, so I ended up being a yellow hat. So, so when you went to work up there, um, you if you were a union employee, you know, just you know, you you had your job, you were a green hat, and then all the bosses were yellow hats. So. Um, I worked up there as, as I got a bit in the mail right department and I, that's where I worked and, and um, yeah. ultimately I ended up becoming a the mail right foreman and uh, which when you become a foreman and you're supposed you wear a yellow hat that's the designation that you're a boss and so when it when they when Ed Hendrickson was my boss and he was salaried and he said well you, you know I'm going to make you my foreman. And I said, okay. Well, he took me over. He says, well, we got to go to the warehouse and you got to get a yellow hat. And I said, I don't need that yellow hat to be a boss. I can, I'm a green hat, you know. And, um, but no, he says, no, no, you got to do it. So I had to go over there to the warehouse with him. He got me a new yellow hat, nice, shiny. <laughs> and to say the least, I took a lot of ribbing of that but those guys up there I mean some of my friends come out of the I remember one of my friends come out of the sheet metal shop and he looked at me and he says I never thought I'd see the day <laughs> never thought I'd see the day but it, it, it was what it was so anyway that's the yellow hat green hat so the relationship then between management and and workers was Talk about that just a little bit. I mean, beyond the yellow hat, green hat kind of thing. Well, I think Bob should talk about it. I think he done a good presentation of that at the this early afternoon. Right. It was it was very it was it was good. So, but I'll let Bob talk about that. I can't remember what I said two hours ago. I always felt, and it was uh, 
that the relationship between the salaried and hourly workforce was excellent. Uh, and one of the reasons, and when I touched on this earlier, was the, the hourly uh, workforce was uh, covered under a collective bargaining unit 361, uh, which is operating engineers. And uh, when you think of operating engineer uh, in, a, in the union, you think then of equipment operators, and pretty much equipment operators only, dozers, loaders, whatever. In our case, uh, this, this uh, mm -hmm. bargaining unit covered everything. We had one, one union on, this, on the hill. They covered sheet metal workers, um, mill rights, operators, truck drivers, everybody. So from a management standpoint, and again from a, a bargaining unit standpoint, when we meant to negotiate a contract every three years, uh, it was fairly simple. We didn't, we didn't have to deal with an electrical union and a, and a bill rent union and a plumber's union and a truck driver's union. And we got along you know, well with that. I don't, I don't think, we might have had tiffs, but I don't believe we had any knock down, drag out, ugly battles that you may think would happen in an organization that was, you know, management versus uh, collective bargaining. So I, I always enjoyed that. And that continued on between the salary and the yellow hats and the green hats and the hourly people pretty often on a Friday or Saturday night, well after closing time. <laughs> he corroborates your story. <laughs> Check to Jay more along those lines, or you? Uh, no, I, I'd like to move on to the next question about um, just that investment of, of that of $17 million when Zona Light, or when Grace invested that money in the new wet mill process. So, you guys is, well, Bob, you were working up there at the time, and, and uh, Mr. Morazzo and uh, Lilo, you guys come on soon afterwards. What were the perceptions in the community? Were you guys happy to see that, excited to have such a new process, and I think the safer process? Just what were you guys thinking when that happened? Well, I think the workers were excited about it because it was a sure thing that was going to continue on, but. I don't think there was a lot in the paper. Most people around town at that time worried more about building the Lady Dam than they were zone like we were just kind of taking for granted. Yeah, and, and I was and I went to work there in seventy four, uh, in the spring of seventy four and in the fall of seventy four is when we moved into the into the new mill. And so I, I don't I don't recall and prior to that, like I said, I would uh, I was graduating in 73, so I was in high school. I wasn't really my, uh, I wasn't concerned with what was going on with the Libby Dam or the mines or anything else at the time. And so I didn't really have a perspective on, from the communities, uh, what they thought about or anything like that. One thing that you, as I remember, the old guys do with Preston, uh, Walt Baker, and if you said anything about the old Zona Lake Company, you're in a fight. I mean, they, they were staunch believers in the old Zona Lake Company, them guys that have been there a long time. Do you, do you think those guys would have, if you would have asked them, did something change when Grace bought the operation? Would those guys, would they probably say that it wasn't as good of a place to work as it was prior to Grace? I would say that because it was about that time, of course, they started handing out written, written reprimands to the union guys. An old horrible form, he'd been there for 30 years. And I remember Ray Belangie coming in from the garage saying, Oh, he says, I had to write my first reprimand today. Marble well, looked at him and he says, I never found, met a man yet I couldn't chew his ass. I don't need to put it in writing. <laughs> Please. <laughs> <laughs>
we were talking about this earlier then, um, if there were any kind of comparisons that you're aware of, or maybe not, that it's, it was interesting to think about when uh, the mill became, uh, went from a local sort of company, Jane Neal sort of company, to a, to a larger corporation company, and if there was any kind of um, correlation there at all, when to, to Zona Light, to WR Grace, in terms of community perceptions. But again, that's, um, that may not be um, any, any kind of ideas there at all. Any thoughts? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, BNT, before your time, yeah. Yeah, you too, yeah. So, um, when, uh, can you describe your feelings when, we probably ought to move on to this, when uh, announced the closure of the mine, um, and how that, how that was uh, accepted, your perceptions of others, but especially your own? Well, I can, you know, I remember, you know, when they talked about the closure, and, and you know, uh, like I, I said at the earlier uh, session, that, you know, it, you could see it coming down the road. Uh, it, it wasn't a total surprise. Our sales had dropped. Um, we were, you know, striving to make a better product. We, uh, Grace had, had put money into some new, new stuff new ways of processing the product but when you when you do that uh, um, at least in our case um, when you're used to making having a mill that produces a thousand tons a day on average and all of a sudden it's down to 600 tons or 800 tons a day to, do, to produce a product that's clean enough to meet the criteria that you're required to or in, even even though when we were doing the, the thousand ton, um, we were within we were within the requirements of the government as far as uh, the emission standards and all that kind of stuff. We were we were compliant, um, but we were uh, other companies didn't want to assume that liability. W.R. Grace ultimately determined that they didn't want to. De you know, and have that liability either, and it was ultimately the lawyers back east that made that determination to close to close the mine. Um, I, I, some of the, I guess, probably the hardest thing about that closure was, is when they <coughs> shut down the mine and the mill, and then they they decided that uh, that they would do the tear down themselves rather than bring in a tear down crew, which is what is normally done, they says, okay, we're going to use our own people, that's going to afford them another couple of years of employment doing the teardown. And so uh, when it come time to uh, determine who stays, who's going to be that you know, elite group of people that stays on the teardown and who's going to you know, have to go find a job, and uh, that, was kind of a, that was kind of a tough call. I was called. I was, you know, I was called in by Alan Stringer, who was the manager, and he, you know, they they had a pretty good idea of the list of people. They there was certain people they needed to have to run certain pieces of equipment to do a teardown, and then there was certain people they needed in our, our, that were just general labor, and you know, Alan at one time he called me into his office and he says, "What do you think about this list of people?" And I looked at him, I said, that's your job. That's not my job, because I was part of the union. I said, I can't tell you to hire this guy or not hire this guy. Uh, it wasn't, it wasn't going to happen for me. It wasn't my place to do it. So that was probably kind of the tough times of the, of the shutdown. The, um, Leroy is you know, correct. I was looking for some figures I found earlier, but um, the the trail towards the, the Grace shutdown was over a long period of time. Uh, I think it was it's 1974 that I cite. It was our, our highest production was 247,000 tons, right? Okay. Uh, and uh, 
uh, prior to that, we worked up to it and we hit that, and then you can start to see the, the, the sales tons drop uh, from there clear to closing. So it wasn't, uh, it was, may have been a shock to, to some people and, or, or, or uh, at least a surprise, but if you were following that, you could, you could see that this, we were not continuing to increase our sales and our production. We were going the wrong way. Um, in that article that I was looking for, I think it, it, it cited two reasons. One was lack of, uh, lack of sales. And, and then the second one was had to do with how you actually mine uh, which means you make your, your sales towards a mining plan that takes uh, your the deposit and uh, mines it equally. You don't hydrate. But uh, what, it, what really happened there is our, lack, our, our loss of sales was a result of O.M. Scott uh, Johns Mansville and United States Gypsum. They were our three largest outside uh, customers and they had concerns about the uh, tremolite or the asbestos uh, content and the, the health that had to do with it. And uh, um, we touched on the labeling earlier in our earlier class, but our product had to be labeled. That, that it did contain a, a health hazard material. And they didn't want that liability, so our loss of sales was a result of that, not uh, because they found something else to, to substitute for us. Yeah. One other thing that I think that, you know, uh, was kind of like a, almost like a, a reprieve for us, or we thought could be a reprieve, and that was, Grace was always looking for ways to use the product that would be a safer product. And they developed a product that was called Monocoat. And they, uh, we talked about that, just it touched on it uh, earlier today. And, the, and, you know, so we thought, well, okay, so maybe we become more of a specialized product and we can still, you know, still survive here. But... Uh, Ultimately, that did not that did not happen because when you you because of the one thing is the mill size was designed to produce you know x amount of tons per hour, but just a just kind of an interesting footnote that maybe some of you know and maybe some of you don't know is that the Monaco six that was that we produced there was used in the twin towers to protect the beams that were that were put on that building. And you know, at the time, you know, we were thinking, oh, you know, it was a, it was kind of a proud thing. You know, we were involved with something to do with, with the building of some big structures and stuff like that. Um, ultimately, it failed, but not because of, not because of the product. And I've watched a lot of some documentaries and stuff on it, on why the towers failed and stuff like that. But you know, so we we did think that you know there was a specialty that we could be. You know we could survive with, but anyway, because Monaco Six was one of those products that was used in to spray on the structure, the main structure of the Twin Towers. So, anyway. Well, the, the day they announced the shutdown, though, was I think a real surprise to everybody. I mean, I mean we knew it was going to come eventually, but I don't think anybody was prepared for it that day. Yeah, and the, and they're there, you know, and I and I talked with the manager about you know about that because it was it was like everybody showed up to work and all of a sudden it's just like we're having this meeting unannounced, no no, no reason, and uh, ultimately the reason for that was that they felt that the workers would sabotage the 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 mine because and the milling. Because they still had several months of operations to do, and they still had product to get, you know, to run through the cycle and stuff. And um, and and I'm glad you brought that because I remember so well. I, I looked at I looked at Alan Stringer and I said, "Do you think that the people that you have working for you are that kind of people? We're not that kind of people. We'll take it in stride, 
and we'll deal with it. And uh, I I'm so will never forget that because it it was kind of like a slap in the face that they, you know, these big shots back east, did, they were afraid we would sabotage their their milling operation, and that's the reason they did it on a on an overnight thing. So. Bob, did, just to, not to put a thought in your head, but this afternoon you talked about a, a man you talked to after the announced shutdown, and, and I think he kind of... Yeah, they was, after the, we had the meeting and they announced they were going to shut down, there was four of us, five of us standing around there talking, and some of us had tears in our eyes, we didn't know what we were going to do, and this guy by the name of Booty Katie, he comes to me, what's the matter with you guys? He said, well, he says, well, he says, 33 years ago, I asked W.R. Grace for a job. They gave me a job. They paid me for every hour and then some that I worked here. And not once did they ever tell me they were going to take care of me for the rest of my life. So he said, get over it. Grow up. Um, I don't know how much time we have left here, but I, a thought came to mind just listening to you guys. And I'm going to see what kind of response I get here. But it's occurred to me that, you know what? Uh, $17 million bill from 1974 and, and the money before, it really was a one-of-a-kind operation. Probably never to be replicated. And you guys, you know, are representatives of the skilled workforce that worked up there that made that go. Now, how do you feel now, uh, 22 years after the fact, of being part of that one-of-a-kind thing that will never happen again? And, you know, the role you guys played with that. So I'm just looking back now, that's... I think it's much different than somebody in a more medial job, I guess. Just, you have any thoughts on that? Well, I know, I, I mean, I was proud to work there. I enjoyed my job. If that, if, if they were still there today operating, I'd still be there working today. And, uh, you know, I enjoyed my work. Um, I told people there if they didn't, you know, I, I, if they didn't like their job, it's something you got to do every day, and if you don't like your job, you shouldn't do it. You should move on and do something you do enjoy. But um, and you know, and I and I was proud of my job. I I enjoyed my job. I I tried to do it well, and uh, like I said, I would. Uh, they were a good company to work for. They were uh, they were community minded. Uh, they were on boards at the hospital, they were on school boards, they uh, attended the functions of the community, they supported the community financially in many, many ways. Uh, and so they weren't, you know, they weren't all bad. Uh, the, you know, from a local level, I would say the, the management team that was here in Libby had the, in, had the interests of the community. And it, and it showed in, the, in what they did for the community. So um, from that aspect, I, you know, they were, good, they were a good neighbor of the community when they were here. I don't think when we worked up there, we, you know, we thought much about being unique work. We were always all welders or crane operators or whatever. I, don't, I didn't feel no different than anybody else, I guess. <laughs> yeah, you know, Bob's right because um, um, when I was a, a, when I was a foreman, a millwright foreman, and if the mill um, if the mill went down, had a plug up or anything, you know, I grabbed. I didn't care if he was an electrician or a millwright or a construction hand or an operator or what it was. You know, the most important thing was to get back, get this mill back to operations because that's what paid our wages, and that's the way that's the way we were. Our our our, our guys would just jump in and do it. You didn't have to, if you know, if there was a power outage, you knew that that mill was going to be plugged up, and there would be guys that would just um, we would just get our rigs and head for the hill because we knew we were going to be needed up there. And uh, you didn't have to have somebody call you out uh, um, all the time. So uh, I think we had a unique and unique group of people in that sense.
Maybe finally, Jeffrey. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've uh, I learned a lot again. Uh, I learned earlier as well as some more tonight. And uh, we do have actually um, high school students as a part of this class as well. And I didn't realize that until until later. But um, so in, with that in mind, um, what would and they're not earning any credit, right, Jeff? No, but no. Okay, so they're just here because they're interested, and that's really delightful. What would you most like our children and our community um, to know or understand about all this? What would you most like our children to remember? Uh, well, again, I'll, I'll do this as I did this afternoon. I'll read. I'm. Uh, <clears throat> the last paragraph of a presentation that uh, I had, had done at one time. It says, uh, as I look back on the closure, I'm uh, overwhelmed by the magnitude of the job. I sometimes wonder how we accomplished what we did. In retrospect, however, there was never a question of whether or not it could be done. The team that was put together knew what had to be done and did it with the highest level of professionalism. Uh, I guess as most younger people now, since this is in the 20 some years ago, wouldn't have known in these, these people that were working or that worked at WR Grace or this community. And the one thing that I guess uh, I would like to, to see uh, carried on here is that our our people and our younger generation understand that uh, in a small community like this that it was really did a, a lot of work together to make this mine successful. Uh, as Leroy pointed out earlier, when the challenges came, we didn't bring in a, a lot of outside help. We had talent right here in Libby, Montana, and. Uh, the, the younger people, the younger generation, um, I would like them to know that not just in the demolition and teardown of this, but the actual building of the mine for years and years and from the 20s on uh, were, uh, wasn't going to be possible without a community that would work together like this as a workforce. Bob, what would you most like our children to know for the future? Well, I think, yeah, to think back in the days, and when we worked, there was like 200 of them, we all knew each other, and we were all kind of friends, and uh, it was kind of, kind of neat, if you, you went to a ball game or something, you, you knew everybody there, and nowadays it don't seem like you know very many people, and the community is so divided, and back then I think we were more united. You guys really are the, the sage on the stage, and uh, the purpose of this is for our, our next generation and generations after that to learn from you guys and the wisdom that you guys have have to share. So, um, has anything else gone unsaid that you would like to, to mention before we conclude this? Well, um, ultimately, the the mind you know, created a black eye in this community. But, you know, I, I wouldn't deter from not trying to continue with, with a mine, whether it's a, a, a gold mine, silver mine, or whatever. I mean, there's a Montnor mine, there's another that they're looking for. And this, I think the generation needs, this newer generation needs to understand that um, you learn from their mistakes of the past, and I think that I think that we have all learned whether it's uh, whether it's forests or whether it's mining or, or anything that has to do with natural resources. I think we we all want to be good stewards of that, and I think that we can understand that there's ways of of doing the mining or doing the logging and stuff in a in a manner that can be 
that can be done in a careful and prudent manner. And I, I, I just hate to see that, you know, you, you, you reflect back, well, that mind created this disease in these people. If we didn't have it, we wouldn't have to worry about it. But it created a lot more than just the disease. It, 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 as Bob said, there was, people were friends and they were, and they, it created jobs and everything else. Ultimately, yeah, it created some, some hazards and stuff. There's hazards associated with everything that you do. Um, but with, like I said, in 20 years, the regulations and what we've learned uh, f f throughout the country as far as whether it's, like I said, dealing with natural resources, we can do it. And we still need, we still need those resources. And so we just need to know that there's better ways to do it and uh, something like this never happens again. And that's how you learn from your from your past mistakes and you go forward with better ideas. And that's what the new generation has got to do. Thanks so much, all three of you. And uh, it's amazing. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this as much as I have as well. Please give them a hand. Thanks for coming, and I believe that's, that's it for the See you next week. See you next week, Thursday night.